Hello, and welcome to the second video discussing regression discontinuity research designs. My name is Chris Curran. I'm an assistant professor of public policy at the UMBC School of Public Policy. In this video, I expand on the discussion earlier to talk about requirements and limitations of the RD, or regression discontinuity design. To begin with, let's just recap what an RD is and its purpose. Often in research, we're interested in estimating the effect of some treatment, a policy or an intervention, for those treated and understanding what the impact of that policy or treatment is as compared to a comparison group or untreated group of individuals or entities. We often think of the randomized control trial, where individuals get treatment or not on the basis of essentially a coin flip, as the gold standard research design. In the previous slides, I talked a little bit about how regression discontinuity can provide plausibly causal estimates. Just to recap the intuition, we can imagine that in the case of a research design, we have a relationship between, say, a variable like SAT and some outcome of student performance. I'll just write that as P here on the y-axis. And we imagine a relationship between the two where there is a break in that relationship at the point or cutoff where some intervention is given. So, for example, we could imagine a college that provides a scholarship for students that achieve an SAT score of 1350. And the notion here is that there is going to be, in this instance, a linear relationship between SAT score and later performance, whether that's college graduation or labor market outcomes. But if assignment to treatment is determined by a cutoff, in this case the SAT score of 1350, we may expect to see a jump or a discontinuity at that test score. So indeed, in this stylized example that I've drawn, we see that at the 1350 cutoff, there is a break or discontinuity in the linear relationship between SAT and later performance. This discontinuity is what we think of as the effect of this case of the scholarship. So the whole intuition of regression discontinuity relies on this idea that right around the cutoff, assignment to treatment is essentially as good as random. So even those students who say sit far at the end of the SAT distribution, maybe scoring a 1600, look probably very different than students that sit further down at the bottom of the SAT distribution, perhaps scoring an 800 or 900. The notion is that right around the cutoff of 1350, in this case where that scholarship is assigned, we can imagine that these students look quite similar. And in fact, the hope is, is that whether they got the scholarship or not essentially became the essence of a coin flip, that whether they scored a 1348 or a 1352 was as good as randomly assigned. And if that's the case, regression discontinuity can provide us with estimates that are plausibly causal. Now, in this slide, I want to focus on the requirements for this type of design to be used, as well as some of the pitfalls or limitations that can come up when using an RD design. So the first requirement I'll briefly talk about is that of having a naturally occurring cutoff. So as given by the stylized example of the college scholarship, RD designs are useful when there is some cutoff typically a hard, fast um, cut point, at which point those above the cutoff or below the cutoff receive treatment, and those on the other side of the cutoff don't. So if you're examining some sort of research question or policy that doesn't depend on a hard cutoff for assignment, an RD is just not going to be an appropriate or usable sort of research design. So for example, if you were looking at, say, the number of suspensions in a school or the proportion of students suspended and academic achievement outcomes, an RD design would be a difficult design to use because the proportion of suspensions is going to vary systematically. It's not as if students are going to be perhaps on a side of a cutoff where a school has suspensions or don't. So you would in that case be looking for maybe a state or a school district that passed some kind of policy such that um, suspensions were implemented in a way that had to do with some sort of hard cutoff. And in the absence of that cutoff, a regression discontinuity design isn't going to get you much distance. The second requirement that I will note is that at that cutoff, the treatment should be the only thing that is discontinuous or the only thing that changes at that cutoff. So one way to say this would be to say there is nothing else occurring at the cutoff. So you might think, for instance, of a cutoff like the federal poverty line 
And perhaps you'd say, wow, the federal poverty line is a perfect candidate for a regression discontinuity design. The only problem with that is that many social programs rely on the federal poverty line or um, some multiple of that to provide treatment. So if individuals were, say, qualifying for housing assistance, but also qualifying for food assistance based on this poverty line, then it's not going to be a useful cutoff for estimating the effects of a single policy. Now, you may be able to estimate the effects of a group of policies if those policies all come with the same cutoff, but to the extent that um, a cutoff is used for multiple different interventions, the regression discontinuity design won't be able to disentangle those. Now, the third requirement I'll talk about relates somewhat to that example, and that is that the cutoff should not be known, or another way perhaps of saying this is that the cutoff should not be manipulatable. So if we're using a cutoff that individuals know ahead of time and can ma manipulate, then we end up undoing the argument for random assignment or the essential coin flip around the cutoff. So for example, if I was using something like a poverty um, distinction or poverty line and trying to implement an RD design, this would be a difficult thing to do or a problematic thing to do because individuals know what the cutoff for income is for the poverty line. And in fact, they may adjust their behaviors, perhaps choosing to work fewer hours or work a slight more hours in order to um, ensure that their income falls on one side of that line. Similarly, in my example of the college scholarship, if students know ahead of time that a scholarship can be achieved by scoring, say, a 1350 on the SAT, then students may have a um, impetus or motivation to take the SAT multiple times until they are able to get their score directly over that cutoff. And to the extent that perhaps more motivated students or students that are more privileged have the ability to take the SAT multiple times, this creates an undoing of the randomness, such that students that fall just above that cutoff might be systematically more advantaged or systematically more motivated than students that fell just below the cutoff. So in general, with an RD design, you want some kind of cutoff that is not able to be manipulated. And a good way for that to be the case is where the cutoff is not known. So if individuals don't know exactly what the SAT score is ahead of time, they can try all they want to get higher scores, but it's not as if a student who falls just short of the required SAT score would know that score and then subsequently retake the SAT until they get the higher score. So in general, this works well for um, cutoffs that are not known or at least not manipulatable. The fourth requirement I'll talk about for an RD design has to do with sample size. And in particular, with an RD design, we want to have a large sample size, particularly around the cutoff. So again, if we imagine the sort of setup of an RD with a cutoff, again, perhaps at a, a given SAT score, the intuition and um, approach here is a focus on individuals near the cutoff. Now, intuitively, the closer we get to the cutoff and the more narrow we set that bandwidth, the more the students, in this case, that just got the scholarship or just missed the scholarship, the closer they look to each, each other and the more arguably exogenous the treatment is in this case. The problem is the narrower we make that bandwidth, the fewer and fewer students we have within the bandwidth. And so we face this challenge or trade-off between having a comparable um, control group or comparison group and having enough power, enough statistical power, to run our analyses. So RD designs are particularly suited for cases where you have large sample sizes, particularly around the cutoff, such that you have enough students near that cutoff um, to adequately implement the design. Now, the fifth thing I'm going to um, talk about, and this will be the last, is a discussion of generalizability um, with regard to RD designs. So item five, this will be generalizability. Often in research design, we make trade-offs between the internal validity and the external validity of a research study. And this is certainly the case in an RD situation. We've talked about the intuition of the RD having to do with individuals directly around a cutoff. But what that means is that if we are, again, thinking about the impact of this college scholarship and we are designing estimates based on individuals close to this given cutoff, we are then estimating a treatment effect or estimating the effect of the scholarship for students that are near the cutoff. 
So with an RD design, we often end up with good credible causal estimates, but for a limited subset of the population of interest. So the RD design in this case wouldn't necessarily give us good evidence of, say, the effects of the scholarship on students that scored really high on the SAT or the effects of the scholarship on students that scored really low. It's really generalizable to those students that fell near the bandwidth. And in the terminology of regression discontinuity design, we call this a LATE, which stands for a local average treatment effect, which is to say that the treatment effect is specific to that local area, in this case the area around the cutoff and near that bandwidth. So this gives you a few ideas about cases where RDs can and cannot be used, as well as some of the benefits and limitations for using RD designs. I hope this is useful for continuing to think about RD as a research method that may be applied to your research, as well as understanding RDs when you encounter them in the academic literature. I thank you so much for your attention and for watching this video, and I hope you join for future videos on research design.